Okay, and I'm live again, so let me just share the link here with everybody. That was fun. Yeah, thanks. Yes, you can see now, here I am, yes. Uh, I was playing bass. I was doing. I was making the best uh, bass player rock and roll face too earlier, and uh, you guys missed it. Um, so, oh look, I've got Cleo Dander on my shoulder. When you have a cockatoo and they perch on your shoulder, they leave white Cleo Dander on there. Uh, so yes, I'll just wait a second for everyone to find the new stream. I am sharing it here, there, and everywhere. Yes, thanks, thanks YouTube. Like I said, back to the Stone Ages. We don't know what's going on. We can't do group chats anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Wine, wine, wine. I guess it's called whinging in the Game of Thrones, the Song of Ice and Fire universe. Anyways, I'm just waiting for everybody to file in now since we had the restart. So thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for coming. De -de 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 -de. Take me to church. So as I was saying, uh, Baal the Bard and I have started a YouTube channel to cover the very cool Netflix TV show called Dark. They just finished season two. The show is awesome. It's loosely, it's a time travel sci-fi show, um, but it's set in this one little German town and all the time travel happens within this town. So it's not like, uh, don't think spaceships or... Um, like, I don't know, uh, Terminator 2. It's not quite like that. Um, it's just awesome. And you definitely got to watch it. There's two seasons. You can binge it really fast. Once you start, uh, I won't let you go. So you can binge both seasons. Then check out Sick Podcast Creatist Est. That's our podcast. There's a saying in the show, Sick Mundist Creatist Est, which means, and thus the world was created. So we named our podcast Sick Podcast Creatist Est, and thus the podcast was created. That's why it's got a funny name. It's Latin, right? Latin, Ball the Bard, that's Latin, right? Pretty sure it's Latin. Or or maybe it's, I won't be German, right? Man, okay, no, it is Latin. I was right, yeah, I was about to say, it's Latin. It's a German show, but Latin saying it's a cult. There's lots of cool occult stuff, um, very cool and Yes, I won't go on and on, but I will just simply say binge dark, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then uh, check out our first video. So we are here to talk about green seer kings, skin changers, ward kings, all that kind of stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed the last couple of videos that I did. <clears throat> Loosely speaking, what we're what we're dealing with now in the post HBO uh, world that we live in, the post HBO show ending world is uh, basically we now know some of the, quote, broad strokes of the ending, and we have to figure out how that will be reconciled uh, with what George is going to do. Because, of course, uh, I think most people that follow my podcast are big fans of the books first. We enjoy the show. We dabble in the show. Maybe some of you abstain from the show. Uh, but any way you slice it, I think we're all book fans first. So... When we had these, you know, the show ending was nice. You loved it. You hated it. Um, hated it. Or either, you know, however you felt about it. Uh, but the important thing is we've got these broad stroke ideas that are probably going to be the same. George says the ending is it's going to be the same and it isn't and it is and it isn't and it is and it isn't. Uh, so essentially um, they're going to be approximately the same. I, I, I steer people towards how uh, the show adapted books four and five, right? A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons, it came across in the show a lot different uh, than it did in the books. So, I mean, it was loosely the same, but, you know, really quite different. And even some of the events that weren't totally changed, also, yeah, so not at all, John Isai says. But, you know, I've, I've started with King Bran. I, I won't sort of beat around the bush. King Bran is, is where it all starts, because in the penultimate uh, Battle of Winterfell episode that we got... Bran really didn't do much. It's the first thing that all of us book fans kind of, you know, tuned in. I, I think, um, you know, what what 
it just it's upsetting. It's like the guy, you know, he broke his legs. He fell out of the tower. He trudged on through the woods up north, um, you know, to the cave of the three eyed crow. Ate ate his friend quite possibly in a paste form. Uh, tripped his nuts off and now is some sort of wizard. Uh, so he's basically given up all of his humanity, many of his friends and family, uh, just to become this great, powerful green seer. Then he comes back to Winterfell and sort of acts weird and creepy and doesn't really do much. Um, so we're trying to figure out what's he going to do in the books. Obviously, he's going to do a whole lot more. So I figured we'd start off by going over Bran's foreshadowing and symbolism and sort of explore the idea of what a green seer king really means. And so that's, that's what we've done. Um, uh, yes. Uh, hang on a second. I'm going to turn my bass amp off. It's making a low pitched hum, which is bugging me. One second. I'm not sure why my elevator makes the space sound, but, or why we have space elevators in the woods. Don't ask questions, folks. It's show business. In any case, Bran is a wizard. He did trip his nuts off and become a wizard. So what's he going to do with his wizard powers? Well, that was the whole Green Seer Kings video. George has basically laid down the foreshadowing for this. He showed us what Green Seers can do. Uh, he's told us about Ward Kings, and he's given us a glimpse of how powerful Green Seers and Skin Changers can be. But what really strikes me when you go over it is like, how just how limited the examples that we've seen of skin changer and green seer magic are a lot more can be done than what we've seen i guess is the easy way to say it like we've heard vermeer six skins can control six different animals and he's not really like the greatest skin changer ever he's not very disciplined you know i don't think he's you could say that he's devoting his life to a monastic study of his magical powers. Like he just sort of uses it in a crude and self-serving fashion and becomes a sort of awful petty tyrant. But if you had somebody like Vermeer um, with a little bit more cunning um, and devious nature, now think of like, you know, Roose Bolton or even Ramsey Bolton with skin changer powers. Think about Tywin Lannister as a Green Seer King. I mentioned Robert Baratheon as like a Green Seer King. Think about him in battle. You know, I mean, you you can really see how fearsome this can be. And so what George has done is he's given us just these little glimpses, I think, of what what can happen so that when he turns it up to 11 at the end, uh, it'll be, you know, pretty amazing. And he doesn't even have to really turn it up to 11, but I mean... Just think about the wolf pack, you know, like that's that wolf pack is terrifying. <laughs> wolves are terrifying. Very large wolves are terrifying. A whole pack of them in the dark is terrifying. Now they're being controlled by wizards and skin changers. This is bad news. Um, you know, the ravens can really f your s up. You know, they can they can they can they can mess you up pretty good. So I mean, you you think about multiple green seers and skin changers. Um, I don't know. I just think the Arya and Bran Wolfpack thing is going to be pretty intense. Hey, Ideas of Ice and Fire. I guess I should say hi to everybody. What's up, Quinn? Hey, SKG Ano. Hey, Dark Mother. Melanie, Wiz, Ball the Bard. Wiz the Smith is actually the honored guest of the day. Um, in fact, I'm going to crack and tacos. I'm going to slap a mod tag on you, buddy. You get a hammer. I think I've lost a couple mods uh, in the last few months. So. In any case, uh, yes. Yeah, so like I said, the, ex the examples that we've seen in the books are very limited, uh, but it's going to go full tilt. And oh, yes, Wiz the Smith. That's what I was talking about. Wiz the Smith has written a very cool essay, which I've referenced a few times, called The Hollow Hills. It's got a longer, longer title. Let's, let's do the long. Let's give him his style here. Oh, one second. In any case, it's uh, it's the Hollow Hills essay. I'm going to have the name for you in just a second. Uh, but basically, it expands on my research by taking a look at the idea of the Hollow Hills as being an indication of green seer or children of the forest activity because we're told that children of the forest inhabited the Hollow Hills. And then we've got the High Heart and Blood Raven's Cave, both called a Hollow Hill. And so what Wiz the Smith did 
is he took a look around Westeros and saw that many of the most famous castles seem to be built over hollow hills and caves of various kind. We find all these different magical caves and uh, they're kind of everywhere. So it's yet another piece of evidence for green sea or kings being very common in the days of yore. So I'm gonna go through, actually gonna sort of skim through and give you some of the bullet points of that essay um, a little bit later in the stream today. I'm gonna do some questions first, but here is the link to Wiz's essay. And if you look up Wiz the Smith on Twitter, it's pinned to the top of his Twitter page. So you can always find it that way. Hey, Tom Cruise. Lady Stoneheart, Kim Abridged. It is great to see everyone. I recognize all the names. Yes, here we are. I was uh, I was looking around for some sage earlier. I was thinking, I should probably burn some sage here, but uh, maybe next week. I did, um, on the first stream, I did let out the ceremonial Garth 420 at the beginning yet. No, I haven't started the book, Misty. I'll get there. In any case, guys, um, so I've got basically the idea today is that we're doing a loose screen Sears q and I've got some questions set aside um, from Patreon and a few from Twitter, but you guys can fire away anything having to do with brand, skin changers, green seers, end game stuff. I mean, I guess it can be anything else too, but specifically I'm looking for, you know, questions about how the, how about the end game is going. And yes, exactly. That's it. My hair witnessed season eight. So it had to go. Now this is actually my classic haircut. I wore this haircut uh, all through like high school and stuff. And then I only grew my hair out like maybe 10 years ago. And every once in a while I shave it off, especially during the summer sometimes just like to get a little little wind, a little aerodynamicness going on. Uh, yes, any case. So Lord Denethor II says, Bran likely isn't leaving the cave in the books. I used to think that, but I think that he probably has to. That's too big a difference from the show. I don't see how the show ending can be anywhere close to the same if he doesn't come back to Winterfell. And I've also found some foreshadowing that Blood Raven's cave will end up being destroyed a lot like it was in the show. And that's something I'm going to handle in the next video, actually. So the full uh, full title is The Caves Are Timeless, Hollow Hills, Magic Castles, and Green Seers. So yeah, it, it is a little grandiose, but uh, fittingly so. It is a great essay. So there you go. All right. Yep. All right. Uh, so where are we? Where do we want to start? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and start with some Patreon questions. Kraken Tacos, who's in the chat, says, much like Vermeer, Bran has committed many abominations, but Bran did so unknowingly. How does that fit into the narrative? Will he be damned for these sins that he didn't know existed? Uh, so that is a good question. George has given us, um, by making Bran very young, and not fully um, conscious of his own potential guilt in the way that an adult is, George has really given us some gray area. You know, like if it was an 18 year old green seer skin changing Hodor, um, you know, for whatever reason, like it would be a little less ambiguous. Uh, it would be unquestionable body snatching and I mean, pretty obviously wrong. And Bran, I mean, he's still, obviously it's, we're given a clue that it's wrong because Hodor is like whimpering in the corner of his own mind. That's kind of a clue that what you're doing is not, not right uh, without consent, as they say, but Bran is seven or eight or whatever he is. So it's just not, you can't judge him quite the same. So I think that it's, it's, um, I guess I, will he be held accountable? I think that there are consequences for actions. And so, Brand, whatever Brand does with magic will face consequences. For example, the Hodor thing in the show, it's going to end at that's something like that's going to happen in the book, um, where there's going to be some sort of hold the door thing where Hodor sacrifices himself and through some sort of time flux, this is how his brain gets fried. It seems pretty, um, pretty, pretty sure that that's going to happen. So, this is an example of Brand doing the tiniest bit of like trying to touch the past. And there's consequences. So it kind of doesn't matter that he's eight. Uh, it, it matters in the sense of how the reader judges him. But if you take a magical action in the story, it has its own consequences. So, uh, and, and most, George seems to really like heroic self-sacrifice. So if you, his, all de, his whole idea about Machiavellianism or um, like take Ned and John, both Ned and John are put in a position where they have to, sacrifice their own honor, so to speak, in order to do like the greater good. Ned tells a lie to save Sansa. 
John even more clearly, you know, ends up going over to the wildlings and killing Corn Halfhand at the command of Corn Halfhand. And this is for the greater good of stopping the wildling invasion. However, John himself is sacrificing his honor by breaking his oaths. So what George likes to tell us about this is that if you decide that you've got to do something quote unquote dishonorable for the greater good, um, you still have to pay the price. Even though it's for the greater good, you still have to pay the price of that dishonor. Ned had to pay the price. He got his head chopped off. John paid the price. He was looked at as you know a traitor when he came back. That obviously contributed to his mutiny and assassination. Um, so if you are going to be that figure who does the sort of bad deed for a good reason, part of you doing the good deed is being willing to pay the price. So if Bran goes and has to do bad things like raise the dead or mess with history, he, there will be a price to pay. Uh, and that'll be part of his heroic sacrifice. Uh, Okanjo, yes, Bran has to be a green seer in the sense that, I mean, he's he's clearly skin changing the tree. That's the best definition we have for a green seer is someone who skin changes the tree. And we're in Bran's POV when he goes into the tree and it works just like advertised. He can see all of the past through the eyes of the weirwood. So I don't think there's any deception going on. Bran is a green seer. Um, the reason why he doesn't have uh, green or golden or red eyes is because it's actually the children of the forest who are said to have special eye colors when they are green seer. Um, and so obviously we think that the Starks and other first men houses like the Blackwoods have just a trace of children of the forest ancestry, which is how they can be green seers and skin changers. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all human green seers should have eyes that are green or red. And Blood Raven, of course, is ambiguous because he's an albino, so we don't really know. Um, there you have it. So, so Kraken Tacos, Bran, th that's how it fits into the narrative, is Bran is almost like too innocent to know what he's doing. Um, and that... I, I feel like it's a whisper of Ender's Game, really. I mean, I don't want to spoil Ender's Game, I guess, if you haven't seen Ender's Game, but the idea that they need a child who doesn't quite understand the weight of his actions to take this one great action that um, that, that somebody else couldn't. So if you've seen Ender's Game, then you can see the parallel. <laughs> I mean, no, I know, I know. It's been out for a couple of decades, but... I just don't want to, I guess, go into a big discussion of Ender's Game, but you guys get the parallel if you've seen it. So, uh, and then Matt Miller follows up Kraken Tacos' question by saying, should we expect additional and or increasingly damning abominations? Yes. Uh, yes, Bran is going to mess with time and Bran, uh, <laughs> Bran will probably try to raise the dead. Winter Sun says darkness will be Bran's best friend. I was like, hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah, that's Bran. Uh, it is probably going to get worse. I also wonder um, about John's resurrection. I've talked a lot about it. I don't need to belabor the point, but I think it's possible that Bran could have a, a role to play. Maybe when John's spirit is wandering the Bardo, uh, Bran will help like direct him back to his body or help him see the truth. But I don't know. I, I think Bran's definitely going to do something worse than what he has. And I also think the Hodor thing hasn't run its course. Uh, it might go, it might, there might be more involved than what is in, um, than just Hodor getting his brain fried. I could see Hodor's corpse getting whited by Bran as a super warrior, even after Hodor dies, or maybe before, um, a little more like Hodor fighting. Because when you look at the scenes of Hodor in the north, he's got a lot of really cool symbolism. He gets the one eye symbolism, he gets ice eyes, he carries around a black and red sword, which he's hitting trees with, icy trees, which are like others. So I, I really have a feeling like Bran warging into Hodor is we're going to see something more out of it than in the show. We're going to see more of Hodor the warrior with Bran inside of him. But uh, we will see. It's a little bit off the off the beaten path. But uh, hey, Ravenous Reader. Hello. Andrew Stephen Bow Wow. Oh, this is a fun one. If the Marsh King, Marsh King's uh, descendants became the Thens, how will that impact the story if with the Thens moving south? And the reason why he thinks that could be, even though obviously Marsh Kings and the Thens are very far apart, uh, the word Fen, F-E-N, 
is Norse for marsh, as in Fenrir, which means marsh wolf. So the Then and the Thens live in that green valley, like the only green valley north of the wall. So I don't know, it seems like a pretty distant uh, connection. But then again, there are wildlings north of the wall who, are main, who retain memories of the green men and the Isle of Faces. Uh, so the Marsh Kings are that old. So it's 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 possible. I, the Thens are mysterious, I will say that. Um, they've got that warm valley up there. They got all the bronze stuff. They got the Magnar sort of kingship that's very unique. So uh, yeah, so fresh and so clean, clean. Thanks, Ben. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew Stephen also asks the show had Benjen come to the aid of both Bran and John. Could Benjen have a second life in the books? Let's say as a dog, would Bran or John be able to recognize him in an animal? <laughs> That's <laughs> woof, woof, what? What's that boy? Timmy stuck in a well? Wait, you're Benjen? What? <laughs> I don't think so. But I do think that we will get an and answer with Benjen. I do think that he's dead. Um, in some sense, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, we actually have a cold hands in the book too and cold hands. Uh, we don't know what happened to cold hands. He fought off the whites as brand and everybody was going into the cave. Uh, and then we don't see anything else about him. So we do not know. We do not know, but I would like to at least know what happened to Benjen. Um, and that would be cool if we had like, more than one cold hands type warrior up there. That would be awesome. I mean, more cold hands, the better. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask that to the chat. What do you guys think? Well, I do think we'll get an answer with Benjen, but what do you think the answer is going to be? <laughs> hey, there we go. I've got, I was waiting for somebody to come in here. Yes. Bye-bye. I mean, I am giving out blocks today if anybody wants one. So in any case, uh, where were we? Next question. If there had been a five-year gap, we would see Vermeer as foreshadowing for Rickon instead of Bran. Well, we might still be. And I, I mentioned this, um, I think it was on an In Deep Geek stream about Rickon. And he was talking about um, what's going to happen when we get the... Uh, the horny goats, the army of cannibals and horny goats from Skagos invading. Uh, and I mentioned that it could be dark because Rickon got separated from his family when he was very young and he was very lonely and angry in the last year that we saw him. His family all disappeared without explanation. And then he's just basically left with his wolf and, um, you know, Osha, the wildling, who's cool and everything, but, but, Rickon doesn't, that's not Rickon's mother or like older sister or anything. So, you know, I mean, this, he's, he's an angry kid. They've gone to Skagos and unless the Skagosi just kill him, um, they're probably going to make a play. I mean, uh, the Starks have a Skagosi grandmother from like just a hundred years ago or so, uh, which seems to have come in the aftermath of putting down that last rebellion where Barth Blacksword died, actually. So, yeah, the, I think there will be some some leaders on Skagos that will recognize a Stark and a Warg Stark as something very interesting. And no, it's not going to end well. That's, I mean, cl clearly, I, I do think uh, it is a shaggy dog story in the sense that it's not going anywhere. Um, but I think it could be dark. You could see him... I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but he's basically going to be a young Vermeer, a wild warg with lots of anger and not very much to root him to, you know, like moral goodness or like, I don't know much of anything. So that's, that could be, that could be pretty dark. And I think that, you know, like I said, the Vermeer stuff could be foreshadowing for what's going to happen, but. All right, um, let's see here. Next question. Oh, I got some good ones on Twitter from Maria Lind. Yeah, so she says, and this is right on topic too. Is somebody speaking the first language? I think that's like the old tongue that Rohit Mera is speaking there. Is that Ravenous Reader? Can you... Uh, can you translate the old tongue happening here? 
it's pretty good. That's pretty good old tongue if you're just like, you know, hacking it. But anyways, so Maria Lind, thank you for sending in these great questions. Number one, I know you aren't a hater, but you're a writer. So how about a discussion of GR uh, George's architecture? I always, I'm sorry, Germs. I have that Germs. There you go. A discussion of Germs architect versus gardener writing style and how it relates to Dave and Dan. Which are they and how did it fail them? I'd love to see what the chat thinks happened with D&D. Boredom, burnout, arrogance, afraid, overwhelmed, simple incompetence. Um, so I, I think that, um, I don't know if anybody listens to the Fandamentals, that is Bell the Bard's uh, podcast, but the snarky ladies on Fandamentals have a, a theory about Dave and Dan that I subscribe to, which is basically the checklist theory, meaning that after they ran out of the book material, what they essentially had was a checklist of things that happened. You know, Bran becomes king, the White Walkers break through the wall and get to Winterfell, uh, Sansa becomes the Lady of Winterfell, et cetera, et cetera. And then so these are like these endpoints that they had to work towards. Um, so this is this makes them very much in the architect side of things. An architect is where you basically you create an outline and then the outline is fairly rigid, meaning that you follow it very tightly and you know that you're working towards certain points and the creativity and the writing comes with um, being creative I'm repeating myself, but the creativity comes from being creative. Uh, it's how you get from one point to another. So it's, you know, if it can be stiff and monotonous because what, you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to disguise your hand as an author. You know, you need to move certain pieces and make certain things happen, but you need to give each character a good motivation to do it so that it seems honest and earned and not forced. And I think where Dave and Dan probably struggle is they, they're not very good at coming up with creative ways to get one piece to the next spot in a way that makes sense. So you have Littlefinger marrying Sansa off to Ramsay. It just, it didn't make any sense. They just needed to get Sansa to the North and that's, they didn't have Jane Poole and somebody needed to marry Ramsay. And so, you know, stuff like that happens. And so that's probably how I'd explain it. They've got the checklist um, and they've got to, uh, yeah, their other podcast, by the way, uh, Kylie and Julia from the Fundamentals, is unabashed book snobbery, and I actually contributed to uh, to their. Um, they gave out some. <laughs> God, they gave out some very snarky awards uh, for Game of Thrones this year. Uh, Bell the Bard, if you want to drop that link, uh, the Golden Carols. That's what it's called. Yes, because Carol is their name for Cersei. Um, she's 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 an angry she's an angry soccer mom named Carol. That's that's how they see her. It's it's pretty funny. In any case, I uh, I contributed uh, my uh, golden pipes to that one. So, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but yeah, I don't think D and D are the greatest. I think they're good, um, probably like showrunners in like organizing a show. That's probably pretty hard, just getting everything together, making it happen. They seem to be good at that, um, but the actual writing is probably where most of us uh, have criticism. The acting is great, casting is great, the setting is is awesome, and body 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 I don't want to go on and on about that but I think that's the major that's the major failing so they're definitely not gardeners if you, if you will when you're following a, a rigid plan that is that is like an architect so oh cool yeah Misty has a video about Rick and Stark that she's dropping in there Misty I haven't seen that but I will check it out very cool I, I saw you above say that uh, it doesn't you don't think it's going to end well for Rick and I would definitely concur so if we accept the end point is John Nissa Nissa ing Daenerys, will it have any connection to ending the long night? What was George foreshadowing with the forging of Lightbringer? How will John parallel Azor High? Will the children of the forest and the weirwood net be involved? Okay, so that's a huge question and obviously one that you guys know I must be thinking about. Um, I had a huge problem like most of you guys did with Danny getting just, just Danny, what they did to Danny in the last season. You know, she spends seven seasons being the champion of the downtrodden, you know, the queen that we chose, you know, according to Miss Sande. And then all of a sudden she's just flips and turns into an evil tyrant because some of her friends died when guess what? She's already seen Viserys and Drogo die. And she's been through all kinds of drama, didn't go crazy and start killing people, only got more determined to defend the weak and oppressed. And then she just flips 
and then John stabs her. And yeah, so I think this is going to be one of the things that is the most different in uh, the books, safe to say. Um, and if it's not, I mean, I reserve, I'll just say this, I reserve the right to not like what George does, but I have a lot of faith in George. And so until I read what he's written, I'm not going to gear myself up for, you know, hating it or judging it. But I think it'll be very different. Um, I've been talking with uh, Melanie Lot 7 and Ball the Bard and a couple other people, Ideas of Ice and Fire, about what I think that could happen. But here's what I think, roughly speaking. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, I guess is what I'm saying. But we have a lot. There's some big ideas brewing here for this. Uh, just as I'm doing a whole King Brand video series, I will probably do a video series on Danny and what's how that's going to happen. But let's just think about where Danny is in A Dance with Dragons. She's in the Dothraki Sea, all right? She is probably going to make her way back to Marine um, with, uh, thanks, Million Lot 7, with the Dothraki at her back. She's going to have some sort of Dothraki horde as she does in the show. Um, then... She's going to be in Marine, and she needs a way to get back to Westeros. Well, conveniently, there's the Ironborn fleet coming in, wiping out her enemies. They're going to make friends with Barristan. Um, that is pretty much set up in the couple of early uh, A Dance with Dragons chapters that we have. So you can see what's going to happen here. Um, Danny's going to get back to Marine, and she's going to see Barristan and Victarion and their allies in charge, Tyrion probably as well. And although nobody really likes the Ironborn, uh, nobody else really has a fleet either. So I'm sure that they're going to work this out. And Victarion and the Ironborn in general, you know, we don't know if Euron's going to like appear out of a puff of smoke and just cut Victarion down and start talking to Danny. But the point is, somehow, as in the show, Danny is coming back to Westeros on the, the Ironborn ships. Hey, Alicia Kingston, good to see you. I, I, uh, I stole your haircut. In any case, um, so we're going to have Danny headed back to Westeros at some sort of temporary alliance with um, the Ironborn. And eventually that is going to lead to an alliance with Euron. Now, at first, I think that Danny will be taken in uh, with Euron because <clears throat> it's basically foreshadowed. If you basically, if you take Dario and his Dar, uh, and smash them together, you find a lot of the components of Euron. If you remember, Danny has that dream of his Dar having the blue lips of a warlock and uh, an ice stick, if you will, the frozen, the frozen peony. Um, and that seems to be foreshadowing, you know, uh, yeah, no, a lot of these are your ideas, Ball the Bard. <laughs> I, I'm told I'm, I'm previewing our, our brainchild here. So uh, we've been brainstorming a bit on this. So, but in any case, uh, Yes, yeah, specifically the uh, the Dario. Um, now you threw me off. Dario and his Dar. The idea that they, if you put them together, you have a lot of Euron foreshadowing because Dario is the is Euron the mood, if you will, as well as the color symbolism. Uh, and then you've got the warlock stuff going on with his Dar. And um, so, in any case, uh, there is going to be some sort of Euron Danny alliance. Now we know that this is bad for Daenerys. Euron does not have any kind of good intentions for Daenerys. And so what we've got here is Danny either sort of going dark and falling under the sway of Euron or possibly even being ensorcelled by Euron. Um, if you think about the House of the Undying Warlocks, what were they trying to do to Danny? They were trying to ensorcel her and sort of steal her magic and steal her dragons. And that is essentially what Euron is going to be doing. Um, so you can see the foreshadowing here. It's just a matter of how long will it run? So when you get back to the idea of someone stabbing Daenerys, what if Daenerys is under some sort of um, enchantment? What if she's gone evil because of Euron's magic? And what if killing her is actually also setting her free potentially? So this could be a lot more complex. She might go you know, when you think about Euron and that vision of the Hands of White Fire Lady uh, that is, you know, if you've read, uh, read the Forsaken chapter, 
you know, who Hands of White Fire Lady is. It's basically Aaron Dampere sees Euron in a vision. There's a lady next to him. It's like a pale shadow, a woman whose hands were flame, something like that. Um, there's all kinds of speculation about who that is. I like to call her White Fire Lady, White Fire Hands Lady. And it could be Danny. Um, it could be Viserion. That's that's also possible, but it could be Danny. And so, yeah, I think it might not be, it could be Euron uh, murdering Danny. It could be that stabbing Danny is done with Dragonglass to free her from a Knight's Queen type enchantment. So there's a lot of ways to go. That's probably all I want to say for now. Uh, I have more, we have more fleshed out ideas that we'll be bringing in the future, but for now, that's that's where I think that is going. It's going to involve a lot more magic, basically. It's not just going to be like, Danny's evil because she burned everybody, so we got to kill her now. Um, I just don't see it's going to happen like that. And as far as the Azor High Nissa Nissa thing, you know, I mean, I started off by saying that Azor High is probably a bad guy and he's not the hero and if he is a hero he's a very dark sort of hero so if we see somebody repeating that then i don't think it'll be held up as heroic and that's one of the clues that uh it's going to be different in the books than in the show because when john kills danny it's basically a good thing that's the way it's portrayed anyways so Melanie Lot 7, do I think Danny's experience with Euron will echo her time with Pyat Pri in the House of the Undying? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's why we can have hope, because Drogon comes in at the last second and burns the Undying. So I think that Danny will probably be under Euron's sway for a time and will probably break away from it. Um, that's what I'm hoping. So, because she does have to fight the others, and I don't think Euron wants to fight the others. Huron probably thinks the others are cool. <clears throat> John Isai says, if John gets a scar and some skeevy facial hair, she'll go for it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, oh, and Melly Lot 7, I, I don't know if you're maybe trying to get more uh, specific there, but Pyat Pri kind of goes mad um, after Danny burns her way out. So, yeah, will Huron be, like, driven mad or something? That would be cool. Uh, and also... You know, I've mentioned a few times that if there is going to be a Night King in the books, it's going to be probably Euron. Either Euron just upping his own level of magic, or if there's an actual Night King spirit in the Weirwood Net, perhaps it will inhabit Euron's body. Um, so, mad already, yes, but like even more mad. Lenny Lot 7, do you think a dragon sweeping in at the end to save Danny will be the way uh, one of the dragons die? Uh, perhaps, but I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, I didn't see any death foreshadowing for Drogon when he saved her in the undying. So I don't know. I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about that. I don't have a good answer. I have to think about that. All right. So Maria Lind says a discussion of the magical side of the Starks and how you think that will drive George's story is Winterfell magical. Is there a magical reason a Stark must always be in Winterfell? What the F is up with the crypts? Good question. What's in the collapsed part of the tunnels? Where's Benjen? Would George use Rickon to tweak D&D? &D? Expand on the Bram duty. Okay. So that's this is a good entrance maybe into the Hollow Hills stuff uh, because Winterfell is really where it comes to. So let's go ahead and pull that up. How's everybody enjoying themselves in the chat? I've had a lot of requests for Starry Wisdom Sunday. That's why we're here. So I hope everyone's having fun. And I will be, um, I will be, uh, what am I saying? Figuring out how to have guests on soon so we can, you know, not just be me talking because contrary to popular opinion, I do like to you know, not be a megalomaniac, share my platform with other people and let other people's ideas happen too on my channel. But, you know, sometimes it's a bad thing, I guess. Discord. Yeah, that's what uh, I've had people suggest that. I thought Discord only did um, audio chat. Are they doing a video chat now? Discord was pretty easy to use. So if they are, that's probably the first thing I will try. 
All righty. So I'm going over to Wiz the Smith's Hollow Hills SA. Ground control to Major Tom. Uh, I hope, I hope, I'm assuming that is a sarcastic comment. No one kick him out until he's definitely proven himself to be a religious fanatic. So I tend to think that's humor. All right, so the caves are timeless. So the premise of this, like I said, is that we're told the children of the forest live in the hollow hills, but Blood Raven's Cave and the High Heart are both named as hollow hills. And those are both places that uh, have obviously a ton of child of the forest magic, green seer, weirwood magic. So the premise of the essay is that we're going around Westeros and we're finding hollow hills everywhere. And frequently they are in the places where kingship and authority um, has been established. So, for example, let's start with Winterfell. Um, it says, this quote is from A Game of Thrones. And it says, it taught him Winterfell's secrets too. The builders had not even leveled the earth. There were hills and valleys behind the walls of Winterfell. Uh, and then we know, of course, that down in the crypts, there are lower levels, older. The lowest levels partially collapsed, I hear. I've never been down there. This is Theon talking in A Dance with Dragons. He pushed the door open and led them out into a long vaulted tunnel where mighty granite pillars marched two by two into blackness. So Winterfell is, build on, is built on a hollow hill. <clears throat> and since we're told that they didn't, um, Major Tom, you're pushing it there, buddy. It doesn't seem like you're kidding anymore. But we're gonna, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you stay here so that perhaps some of us, some of our, our good mojo will rub off on you. In any case, Winterfell is built on top of a hollow hill. And so how, how many of you would be surprised if we get down to the lowest levels of the crypts and we find weirwood roots or even a weirwood throne? Not me. Um, Wiz the Smith also adds that fell means hill. So winter fell could also mean winter hill. And it literally is a hill. And uh, the important thing is that we're told that the crypts were there first. Um, either we're told that or it's strongly implied. I forget which. But it really seems like what we have here is that we had a weirwood here first. Um, because we're told right at the beginning of the Game of Thrones that the weirwood watched Bran the Builder set the first stone of Winterfell. So that means that first thing we had here was hot springs and weirwood tree. At least that one, there are, although there are, more, there are more in the Wolfswood. And so then they go ahead and build this castle and they build the crypts down in there. The oldest part of the castle is the first keep and the crypts are under the first keep. So it's all very likely uh, that basically the crypts were built first. And so, I mean, look, take a look what's going on here. We're building around a weirwood tree and underground caves and a hollow hill. And then the first guy that we have that founds House Stark is Bran the Builder, who was taken to a secret place to learn the language of the children of the forest, which, um, as I mentioned in the video, probably means that he learned how to be a green seer or a skin changer, because the idea of language and speaking and song is so tightly tied to magic in this story. So, <clears throat> basically, he learned the song of Earth, the true tongue, right? Let me use my cough button. So essentially, this fits in with what I'm saying here, that Bran the Builder was likely a green seer, possibly a part child of the forest. Hope you guys like my little Photoshop mock-up of a uh, child of the forest Bran uh, in the video. Um, I did my best. In any case, uh, so you've got you know, a house Stark, like I said, from the beginning, probably green seer kings and warg kings building their castle around a weirwood and hollow hills. And if Bran comes back from uh, the Blood Raven's Cave, which I think is almost certain that he's going to do, to me, the coolest thing would be if there was a weirwood throne down there that he can sit in. Not all the time. And we don't want to confine Bran to like the lowest levels of the crypts for all eternity. And as I've pointed out, green seers don't need to actually touch weirwood to access the weirwood net once they're, um, you know, bonded to the trees or whatever. However, uh, 
you know, I like the idea that he goes and sits down in the weirwood throne there and we get some special uh, goodness going on. So, well, so they didn't build a big castle 8,000 years ago. The, um, even the first keep itself uh, is said to have been rebuilt. So we don't know what the first actual building was. It was probably just a ring for it that turned into a keep or whatever. Um, but <clears throat> anyways, we have a drink here. So the low, the bottoms of the crypts, I mean, this is the coolest, one of the coolest magical sites in the books. And one of the things I'm most looking forward to seeing for sure. Um, I think John's going to wander down there in spirit form when he's dead. And I think that Bran going down there to find a weirwood nest, a weirwood root nest would be cool. I'm definitely hoping for that. Uh, and maybe, so maybe if you, I mean, if you really want to go full tinfoil and you're going to get some sort of raising the Stark dead or something or making, you know, uh, good whites to fight the bad whites or any sort of version of that, maybe that's where Bran does the, uh, does his extra, his last naughty green seer thing and raises the dead <clears throat> down in the crypts where it's very dark. Uh, one thing I'm going to dwell on um, in the next, is it going to be the next one? No. Uh, so let me give you guys, let me sketch out what the next two videos are going to be. Next video is going to be about Bran as a summer king in the tradition of Garth the Green, uh, as far as like the Oak King, Holly King, Summer King, Winter King dichotomy. Um, John is a king of winter figure. Bran, it turns out, has a ton of summer king stuff going on around him. Uh, his wolf is called Summer. He's called Summer Child, all that stuff. Uh, so that's going to be the second video. Third video is going to be about the Grey King and Bran and the Lightning Tower idea. And that is going to basically be a distillation of the Grey King Green Seer Throne theory. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to my, like my very most compact version of it. Uh, and then I'm going to show why that's important for understanding Bran as a Green Seer King. And that's actually going to give get us into some very specific foreshadowing because I found out that Bran has this reoccurring thing with the whole lightning tower, green seer abilities, um, symbolic setup. He does it several times. He does it at Winterfell when he's sitting down in the crypts and warging uh, summer up above. He does it at Queen's Crown. Um, they do it at the Night Fort. And then I think in Blood Raven's Cave, we'll, we'll see the same symbolic setup again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into that in the third one. Uh, but I'm really excited about this brand series, guys. I've already written the scripts for the next two. Uh, so I know where it's going. And it's going to be pretty fun. There really is a lot of brand Green Seer King stuff. Uh, so getting back to the Hollow Hills and Bran the Builder. Like I said, he was taken to a secret place to learn the language of the children of the forest. I like uh, uh, Wiz's line here, so I'm going to read it. The tale is not worth repeating because we're already reading it. Learning to comprehend the children's speech is exactly what our green seer Bran is doing, the wind and the leaves in particular. It seems his age of hero's namesake went through the same process, evidence that he was perhaps learning to be a green seer. So well put, Wiz. I agree. I think that, again, like I said, that's what that means, learning the language of the children, to comprehend the speech of the children, we're learning magic, guys. It's not literal linguist stuff, if you will. So uh, next next spot is Storm's End. This is a really interesting one. So check out this quote. The seaward side of Storm's End perched upon a pale white cliff, the chalky stones sloping up steep, <laughs> the chalky stones sloping up steeply to half again the height of the massive curtain wall. A mouth yawned in the cliff, and it was that Davos steered for, as he had 16 years before. The tunnel opened onto a cavern under the castle where the storm lords of old had built their landing. Then they were passed, engulfed in darkness, and the water smoothed. The little boat slowed and swirled. The sound of their breathing echoed until it seemed to surround them. Davos had not expected the blackness. So there you go. Storm's End is obviously a very old, magical place. It's got a very old, huge weirwood, or at least it did until Melisandre burned it, foreshadowing cough, cough. And underneath of this castle is a giant cavern. 
a cavern that's, if you recall, warded by magic. We don't know when that was when that happened, but um, that if you remember that that was where the the spells set in the cave were the old ones. So we covered this in the old ones essay because these are old ones spells, just like at the wall. And so this is really uh, eye catching because basically there are two places, three places that we know that specifically old spells are set into a physical location. Blood Raven's cave is warded by spells. The wall is warded by spells. Storm's End warded by spells. Bran the Builder supposedly was involved in building Storm's End as well as the wall. Um, and so you see where this is going here. Storm's End is very likely to be a very old place connected with Green Seers and the Children of the Forest. Uh, and you guys know that the first Storm Lord during God's Grief probably wore an antler hat. Uh, we, we, you know, Durin isn't specifically described as wearing antlers, but the very first Storm Kings that we hear of wear the stag, uh, the antlered stag crown. And um, we know that they have an old tradition of wearing the stag antlers on their battle helms. We don't know when it started, but it's logical to assume that it goes back to the first Storm Kings because where did they get this from? Obviously the green men. I mean, that's, that's what the Storm Lords are doing. They're dressing up like Garth the Green. Uh, in battle mode, if you will. And so Durin God's Grief is basically, he's a green man figure. He's challenging the gods, stealing a goddess from the gods, and then building a magical castle with the help of Bran the Builder or maybe the Children of the Forest over a hollow hill location. And there's a very old weirwood there. So this is prime Green Seer King territory here. It's very likely that Durin God's Grief if he was a um, a real person, was uh, was a green seer king, and and really when you look at um, when you look at the like the green king of the god's eye and uh, Garth the Green, it seems like there's actually a lot of people emulating green men and trying to be kings, and this in general is is evidence of that green seer kings are a thing. So that's a good location. Uh, then we've got Casterly Rock, Land the Clever. Um, you know, Jamie has a nightmare of being in a cave below Casterly Rock. And when he's narrating the dream to itself, uh, to himself, it says, there were watery caverns deep below Casterly Rock, but this one was strange to him. So the dream version of the cave is not totally real, but his inner monologue tells us there are caves under Casterly Rock. Of course, we know there are mines. And there's even a, a weird one. It says... There is even a god's wood of sorts, though the weirwood that grew uh, that grows there is a queer, twisted thing whose tangled roots have all but filled the cave where it stands, choking out all other growth. So it's kind of like a grotto. That's what I picture. It gets some light. So you've got a weirwood tree growing in a in a cave grotto, which is pretty wild. Um, that actually reminds me of that chapter in the Rainwood, where Ariane and her company go underground and they see. Weirwood face, you know, weirwood style faces, heart tree faces, but carved into stone. They're on stone pillars and on a stone wall. And we don't know if these are, you know, the stalactites and stalagmites that have grown together to form these pillars that were then carved, or if somehow these are like petrified trees, petrified weirwood trees that have somehow become underground. Um, that to me seems a bit of a stretch, uh, but. I will say that this weirwood in the grotto at Casterly Rock does show us that weirwoods can grow in caves if there is light that gets there. So perhaps these weirwoods grew down in a cave that got covered over uh, thousands of years in the past, um, you know, something like that. So and Wiz the Smith points out that weirwood saplings are growing above that cave in the rainwood as well. The rainwood's full of Weirwoods. So yes, very cool. All right. And so going, getting back to Casterly Rock, um, Land the Clever is an interesting fellow. He supposedly lived to the age of 312. And during God's Grief also had a long lifespan. Um, we know the long lifespans is one of the things that probably derives from the legend of Green Seer Kings living longer. I mean, that's it's the most likely real source of that legend, if there is a real source. So when we go around and see some of these guys like the Grey King, like Durin God's Grief, 
that are said to live beyond a normal lifespan. Well, if there's any truth to that, it's almost certainly a green seer thing. So Leon the Clever supposedly lived to the age of 312, oddly specific age, um, and sired a hundred bold sons and a hundred lysom daughters, all fair of face, clean of limb, and blessed with the hair as golden as the sun. So the thing is that one of the tales about how Lan stole Casterly Rock was that he was whispering threats in the ears of the sleeping Casterlies or howling from the darkness like a demon. And that convinced the Casterlies that their, their caves were haunted. But whispering in the darkness, that's kind of like green seer language. Um, you know, obviously blood raven whispers, the leaves whisper. Um, so you have Lan like haunting the hollow hills and whispering everyone. And also he um, he uh, dyes his hair too, which has some symbolic import. And he was he stole gold from the sun. And that's more like Prometheus, Lucifer, challenging the gods, stealing the fire of the gods kind of stuff. Uh, so there we go. Then we've got High Garden and Garth the Gardener. Uh, I won't belabor that. I'll belabor that one because I'm going to talk about that a lot in my next essay. But of course, Garth the Green is like a green man king. He planted weirwoods. Um, we don't know about hills below High Garden, but High Garden is itself a hill. So I'd almost be surprised if it didn't have caverns. And the entire thing is like a garden city. So it's you know, when we're told that the um, the children of the forest used to live in tree towns, the original High Garden was almost like Garth the Green building like his version of a tree town that's like more adapted to humans, but it's still kind of like a tree town. So pretty cool stuff. And I'm just checking out the chat here. Cool. Wiz, I'm glad you're getting some questions and some love here, buddy. Wiz the Smith, of course, Ravenous Reader, and a few others like Blue Tiger. Uh, go all the way back to the westeros.org forums. Spent many years kicking around these ideas together. So good to see you guys here. Good to talk about this fun essay. Um, the trees are called the Three Singers, of course, the weirwoods that Garth plants. So you have the whole singing songs. Um, you know, the children are those who sing the song of Earth. You know, let me bring you songs from the woods, etc. And a high garden also has a maze too, which is more like weirwood net maze symbolism. So there we go. So uh, in conclusion, this first section, Wiz is pointing out that we've got four legends from the Age of Heroes that have built their castles above caverns and hollow hills. They're all rumored to have fantastical and extended lives, uh, the kings that ruled there. So these these are pretty strong, you know, um, contenders here. And the rest of the essay has some other places. I'm not going to go through every one, but one of the interesting ones is the High Tower. Uh, this quote is, is cool from the World of Ice and Fire. Within the narrow, twisting, windowless passages strike many as being tunnels rather than halls. It is very easy to get lost amongst their turnings. Mayhaps this is no more than a defensive measure designed to, con designed to confound attackers, but it too is singularly unvalerian. The labyrinthine nature of its interior architecture has led Archmaester Quillen to suggest that the fortress might have been the work of the maze makers. So, you guys know we've talked about this a lot. This is a fused stone fortress that has weird cave-like uh, passages beneath it. It's hard to tell if the tunnels are dug out by a dragon fire, like fireworms, or if they built a fortress on top of a place that already had tunnels. Um, it is not clear from the wording, but either one is interesting. And of course, the first high towers lived down in the tunnels and now they live on top of the tower. And you guys know the high tower symbolism is that of a weirwood. It's a white tower crowned with a red flame, whereas weirwoods are white trees crowned with red leaves that look like blood and flame. And from the top of the high tower, you can see very far and practice magic. So it's a very elaborate, not elaborate, but it's a very, um, specific weirwood metaphor, the entire high tower. Uh, and so you've got hollow hills beneath it, just like there should be beneath the weirwood tree. Um, and of course we often find dragon symbolism in the tunnels uh, below the weirwood tree, such as Blood Raven living down there. And that is of course going back to the Nidhogg serpent living under Yggdrasil. So often when you find the hollow hills, 
you're going to find dragon clues and stuff going on there as well. Such as at High Guard, uh, at uh, Old Town. So then, um, and Uthor Hightower is an interesting fellow. Uh, he is another, you know, he stole a woman and I don't know if he challenged the gods, but he definitely uh, has some interesting symbols. I don't want to get too lost on Uther Hightower. Um, I'm going to cut that off. At, I'm going to nip that in the bud, but he's an interesting fellow. And of course, I've compared him to Uthor Underleaf, who has cool green seer symbolism. Uh, Horn Hill, that's another big one. Harlan the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn. Sam Tarley's ancestors. Um, you know, Harlan the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn. That, of course, is a Hearn the Hunter reference. Hearn the Hunter being an undead stag man, Sir Nuno's figure. I've talked about him extensively. I won't need to beat that bush any further. But basically, Sam has all that same stag man symbolism that Hearn the Hunter does sort of, you know, placed on him. So you go to the place that the Tarleys are from and, oh, look, it's Horn Hill. And the notable story about that is that Harlan the Hunter and Herndon of the Horn were twin brothers. They were children of Garth the Green, who built their castle atop Horn Hill and took to wife a beautiful woods witch who dwelled there, sharing her favors for a hundred years. For the brothers did not age so long as they embraced her whenever the moon was full. So this is some witchy blood magic shit, of course, but it's also extended lifespans. This woods witch sounds a lot like uh, the ghost of the high heart, Wiz points out in his essay. And they, of course, are, they got the stagman symbolism and they're doing magic on top of a hill. So you guys put it together, you know. That is, uh, and they're children of Garth. So again, that looks like a pretty good one. Um, he talks about the wolf's den in where the Manderleys live. And the Manderleys, of course, we know they have cool green man symbolism. They call themselves Knights of the Green Hand. They were expelled from the Reach, and now they have all this merman symbolism. The, the merman's court is their throne room. It's all painted to be under the sea. So, of course, ravenous readers under the sea metaphor comes into play here. You've got a green hand guy who is the lord of the sea. You know what I mean? This is obviously green seer king symbolism. He's also half a corpse. Uh, Wyman is just like Blood Raven. Um, so, there's a lot of green seer symbolism. And if you, get, if you guys remember, uh, Davos is imprisoned in the Wolf's Den, which is this, which is the oldest fortress uh, at this place. White Harbor is the new city built on the other side of the river mouth. And the Wolf's Den is the old Blackstone fortress where they have the God's Wood. There's caves underneath of it. And uh, Wyman Manderley takes Davos from the Wolf's Den back to the castle by going um, this cool passage that goes underneath the castle stair. So there's like an official stairway and then there's like a secret stairway underneath. So there's this whole section where they, they go through the God's wood and then go down into the cellar and through all these caves and stuff. So basically we've got a very old for first man fortress with a weirwood and a bunch of caves there. Um, and this is also one of the specific places where we're given a legend of sacrifice to weirwoods. If you remember that passage about Brandon Ice Eyes, um, uh, is it Brandon Ice Eyes or John Ice Eyes? I always forget. It's John Ice Eyes, right? He comes down and uh, roots out the slavers, and the, he lets the slaves hang uh, the slavers, you know, in a, it festooned their organs and limbs among the tree limbs. So, so you have a specific old god sacrifice there as well, as well as lots of really cool symbolism when Davos goes there. But I've covered that in other episodes so it was king john stark that raised the wolf den and brandon ice eyes who came down and rooted out the slavers so there you go deck the weirwoods with seasonal entrails la 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 totally nice one bailed bard it's very joyful it's very festive um so yes, I guess I, I don't want to let all, I'll, I'll, I want you to read the essay. So I won't, I won't give you every single one. Uh, he mentions uh, the Osgrays of Stand Fast and Deepwood Mott, which has very cool symbolism. You guys know Deepwood Mott is the place from uh, Asha's chapter where the trees are personified as humans, like five different ways. 
So that's a good one to check out. The Night Fort, that's the one I want to talk about. You guys know I love The Night Fort. I happen to believe that, um, oh, hey, Lauren's Corner. Yeah, let me give you the whole shirt. So Pink Floyd, wish you were here. And it's got the pyramid there at the bottom. Pyramid eyes, I'm like, cool. Those are my friends. So anyways, um, Night Fort. Yes, The Night Fort. So you guys know, I think that The Night Fort was probably built around the weirwood organism there. Um, it, similarly to Winterfell, um, the, the weirwood organism is not, it just seems like the oldest thing there. It's a completely unique thing because it's got the, uh, get my stone back out. It's got the talking face, the weirwood face. And we've. this is like probably the weirdest, most magical thing in the entire story possibly a talking weirwood face that opens its mouth and becomes a gate that everybody then walks into that leads to a, a cave. We One time we had a great thread on Twitter trying to figure out what's on the other side of, of the weirwood mouth. Is it like another weirwood mouth that spits you out? Is it just a cave? Is it a weirwood anus? We don't know. We were unable to figure it out. We don't know. Bran just walks into the mouth and through the tunnel, and then later he's just north of the wall, and he never tells us. So, yeah, we don't know. The weirwood anus. Wow. Yeah, so you get something unexpected every time you tune into an LML stream. That's why it's Starry Wisdom Sunday. Back door. Yes, it's it's the back door. It's the sinkhole. Okay. Oh, this is bad. We've got to, got to take it out. Yeah, weirwood cloaca. Thank you. As a bird owner. That's that's I was actually thinking of that, but I, I was too chicken to say it. So thank you, Gabrielle. In any case, the weirwood mouth is fucking weird, man. It's weird. It's really weird. And the um the weirwood sapling that's growing up through the floor of the night fort, this is an important clue. It this is not a planted weirwood. Nobody planted that thing. It's growing up through the stone floor. So this is not even a seed that like somehow got lodged in the crack probably what we what we most likely have is a giant underground weirwood organism that then sprouts trees up from the bottom and we've talked about the fungus symbolism of the weirwoods but that's basically i think how we should understand the weirwoods the roots are the real organism and the trees that pop up are basically like the mushrooms um you know the it's really the root network that's important and even the high heart where all the trees are chopped down, the old gods linger here still. Like it's the root network that's really important. So, oh God, Raven Salix has taken me seriously. She's all, it can't be an anus because cold hands help Sam say the oath when he's traversing the gate from north to south must be a two-faced gate until you think, unless you think he was talking to an ass. <laughs> okay, I guess not taking it that seriously. That's funny. No, that would be cool. So, So you have to, you have to recite your weirwood oaths to a weirwood butt on the north side. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Ravis. Um, completely lost my... Oh, yes. Night Fort. Night Fort. So basically what I'm saying is that, yes, it's this is like a fungus organism. Um, the root network underground is the real thing. And so even if all the trees get chopped down up, you know, up, uh, above the ground, eventually it'll sprout, you know, new trees. And so I think that's what's going on here. The sapling that's growing off of, growing out of the floor is probably connected to the, the gate itself. It's like a sapling, yeah, like Wisdom Smith is saying. It's like a branch or a sapling that's growing off of the, the, the gate. So the organism itself is huge because I was rereading the chapter today and when Bran is going down the well, right? And when he gets to the little side shaft that goes to the weirwood face, he looks up at the top of the well shaft and it says it was only the size of a half moon up above, which means he's gone pretty far underground, more than like 20 feet, more like 50 feet, 80 feet, something like that. Um, so this is a huge weirwood organism. And to me, the, before the wall existed, before the night fort existed, this weirwood organism would have existed. It could be thousands of years old. I mean, these weirwoods don't die. So what I'm seeing is that the night fort was probably built first to take advantage of this weirwood tree or organism there, just like Storm's End or Winterfell was probably built around the weirwood. 
And eventually, um, I think Night King, you guys know, I don't think Night King lived after the long night. I think it was during the long night. I think it was the long night antagonist, if you will. And so, yeah, I think the wall might have been built after the long night. But during the long night itself, I think that Night King ruled from the night fort. I definitely think Night King was a green seer. I think that there are weirwood clues all over Night's Queen and King and the creation of the others. You guys, I, you guys know that I think the weir, uh, the others are kind of like exiled tree spirits that were somehow evicted from the trees when Azor High invaded. Azor High then became Night King, or his son became Night King, and so essentially, you, it's really the same story: Night King creating the others, Azor High, you know, seizing magic from the Green Seers and evicting the others from the Weirwood Net. This is really the same story. Um, and so I think the the weirwood organism at the night fort is super important. This could very well be the site of the original creation of the others. Um, I mean, it's the most likely place. So I think the night fort will continue to fig figure into things. Um, I'd love to see it again. And uh, the weirwood face is very cool. And I have no idea what this live stream is about because we're talking about the weirwood face now. And I love the weirwood face. But the Night Fort is another hollow hill. That's the bottom line. And it's this, and it's the was anybody king at the Night Fort? Yes, we had a Night King there. So lots of stories about cannibalism. All right. Well, the thing is, um, I don't know how to change names. He's commenting the Night Fort is more like a dividing line than a center of birth. But the thing is, the dividing line was created when the others were created, I think. Like, the division of the Weirwood Net happens with the with the creation of the others. That partition is the exiling of the others from the rest of the Weirwood Net. So the place where they're created and the place with the partition drawn, that's all the same idea. That's why the wall runs through the Night Fort, um, in my opinion. Um, Wiz the Smith says Tyrion mentions there are weirwoods growing in the shadow of the wall where the Night's Watch haven't been cutting down the encroaching weirwoods so weirwoods originally across the length of the entire wall quite possible and we don't know what's under uh, under the ice either so no. oh my gosh it's 119 where's my does it really not give me a camera mute? Oh gosh, this is going to be tricky. Um, here you go, guys. Uh, wear this hat for a moment. There. Uh, um, here, you're just going to wear a party hat. We're going to. Ah, damn it. Let me just fucking. If I can. Sort of get this. Okay. Um, one second. Ah, I was muted. <coughs> mm. uh, yeah, sorry. I'm not working the whole cough button thing very well here. I seem to have gotten off track somehow. Uh, what were we talking about? Yes. Uh, green Seer Kings and stuff. And oh, look, my ashtray is burning. It's always a... Uh, always make sure to put out the fire in your ashtray, children. 
it's a good way to good way to cause damage. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, Stone Dancer, you're late. I played some Tool earlier, but that was on the canceled stream. So, One more time. Stone Dancer, and all of you guys who have had to sit through the bass playing and didn't want to, blame it on Stone Dancer. All right. Thanks for indulging me, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And yes, I'll, uh, I'm working on uh, Numa. That riff's really tricky, guys. That one's, that's a tough one. I got a, I don't even know what time signature. It's like 11 and a half, eight time signature or something but in any case so where's the smith uh mentions a couple other places oh you know the one other place that i will mention in conclusion with the night fort in the wall that sort of fits in with our conversation is um oh yeah totally lauren's corner i will get you yes i need all the mod help i can get all right so um gendel and gorn gendel and gorn this has to prick our interest. There were, they were called upon to mediate a dispute between a clan of children and a family of giants over the possession of a cavern. So already we're talking about children of the forest and a cavern. Gendel and Gorn, it is said, ultimately resolve the matter through trickery, making both sides disavow any desire for the cavern after the brothers discovered it was part of a greater chain of caverns that eventually passed beneath the wall. Gee whiz. So this is one of those... Um, uh, oh, yeah, Alicia, I will get you, too. Um, so use it wisely. Use it wisely. Um, so this is really interesting because we've got the weirwood organism of the night fort. We've got the wall. We've got weirwoods growing up out of the forest all along the wall. And now we've got tunnels going under how much of the wall? We have no idea. We have no idea how extensive those tunnels go. We know that they used to be associated with the children according to legend. So, I mean, if you want to, you can speculate that the caves go through the entire continent because the weirwood roots might go through the entire continent. And it could be the weirwood roots that are creating the caves by growing, growing through there um, or something like that. I mean, I'm probably getting trying to get too scientific now, but point is this is a magical, Westeros is a magical land and the roots of the weirwoods, like I said, all the fungus symbolism leads one to perceive the weirwood roots as sort of being all interconnected like the roots of a real forest are connected through mycorrhizo fungi in the in the soil um and and you know real forests actually share information through the root networks and stuff so i think that george is just taking all those natural concepts uh like the pando quaking aspen thing and and you know trumping it up with magic as he likes to do and so you get you know, like I said, the, the caves could go through the whole damn continent. Maybe Bran will get down on that. He'll make a, he might escape 
Uh, Blood Raven, this is what we used to joke about. Bran's going to escape Blood Raven's cave on a raft. They're going to go down to that river uh, down there, and they're going to they're going to go all the way to the crypts um, on a raft in an underground river, but probably not. We might get some of that. I do think we will get more use of the underground than we did in the show. Like, if nothing else, um, we're going to see the lower levels of the caves or the crypts, which we never saw in the show. And Bran does have to get back somehow. We've already had him slog over land to get to Blood Raven's cave. So, oh yeah, <laughs> ravenous readers, Mira will build the boat. Of course, of course. Maybe this isn't tinfoil. Mira does know how to make a boat with like damn near anything. She's like MacGyver. She could be like, oh, give me a string, pack of matches and some toothpaste and I'll make you a skin boat. Yep. I don't know why MacGyver suddenly has a Southern accent, but nevertheless, the Cranog men do make boats. And if you go back to the Night of the Laughing Tree story, which is important foreshadowing, um, Howland Reed makes a skin boat and sails himself out to meet the green men on the Isle of Faces. And as I mentioned in the video, um, Bran might be going to interface with the Isle of Faces. And so, yeah, I would love like a foreshadowing or like a, it would basically be a call out to the Howland Reed Night of the Laughing Tree story. If Mira made a boat <laughs> and they sailed on the river uh, out of Blood Raven's Cavern. I love that. Um, I don't know where we'd get a hold the door though. We got to hold the door somewhere. Um, I have speculated that the door that needs to be held will be in the wall um, uh, because who was it that figured out Waldor? So Hodor's original name in, in the books is Walder, but Walder could be wordplay for wall door. So when Hodor is going to hold the door, it could be a door in the wall. Uh, and there are some other clues about that. But um, I'll just wait for Ravenous Reader to tell us who came up with that idea because she remembers everything. But yeah. You guys like the boat theory. This is cool. And plus, uh, Grey King has a weird boat, guys. Right? Right? So weird boat, right? It's, a sh it's not just a metaphor. Maybe it's a, it's a real thing. I like this. It's good stuff. Uh, that's right. Dunk the lunk, uh, thick as a castle wall, holding the door for poor egg on the fourth. Oh, that's like a rhyme. Holding the door for poor egg on the four. Ah, very nice. It's almost like you're a linguist. All right. So yeah, you do need a boat to be on the sea. Ravenous reader, I love it. Let's conjure up some more concrete tinfoil here. I'm on a boat. All right, so that's it. Uh, I will drop the Hollow Hills link once again. Uh, Wisda Smith, thank you for providing us content today. You are awesome. There is the link for the Hollow Hills essay. All right, so guys, um, no, I'm not playing any more bass. <laughs> I will I will start driving my subscriptions down. Less is more, less is more. Um, so, oh yes, Carl Karsnark uh, points out that, of course, M-E-R, which means C in French, so as uh, like mermaid, uh, mirror, the city of mirror. Uh, they make lenses so you can see. Um, Mira, M-E-E-R-A, she's got the mirror uh, prefix, so yeah. Nice. I can't think about anything now other than Mira making a boat and Bran her sailing it straight to the crypts of Winterfell, coming out, plopping his butt down on the weirwood throne. Yes, it's got to happen. Um, I am. I think it's in. Uh, so one of the thing about writing two essays ahead of time is that I can't. I sometimes forget which things I've included in the video that I already put out and what's in the videos that I haven't put out. But uh, I think this one was in the video. So when Jojen and Mira come to, yeah, it was, uh, no, it's not. Okay, so this is this is in the one you haven't seen yet. So sneak peek here. Mira is, uh, Mira and Jojen descend from the Marsh King. Uh, the daughter of the Marsh King married a Lord of Winterfell. So Jojen, uh, Bran and Mira, are kind of like an echo of the daughter of the Marsh King 
and the Lord of Winterfell who married the daughter of the Marsh King. So I don't know if Bran and Mira will, I mean, I, I don't think Bran can like, you know, have babies and stuff. So I don't know if they'll, there's obviously like a playful crush romance going on there. I don't know that it will ever go any further than that. Nevertheless, the roles are there as an echo. Uh, so I just love the idea of Mira aiding Bran's escape by using like her Marsh King skills, you know, by making a boat, uh, doing something that she's good at. Like Mira pulling a sled through the woods, like it doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So maybe it'd be a cold hands thing. Um, but easy SKG Anno, come on now. Easy there. So, all right. So hook me up, chat. Give me some questions. What do we want to talk about next? If we can pull ourselves out of the swamp, guys. Uh, Alicia Kingston points out that Brand's plumbing could work. It's not necessarily ruled out. Okay. All right. Bad knowledge on my part. Um, well, they do say that, doesn't Eddard say he will never father sons in the book? Um, yeah, it all has to do with like what, which vertebrae, where the break happened, I think. And I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. Damn it, Jim. I'm not a doctor. Oh, is magic bad? Oh, there you go. Raven Salix. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, this is, um, something we were kicking around on Twitter. I asked the question, is there any sort of example of magic that isn't bad or yet to be determined ambiguous. And so this is a, a open question. Um, the best we could come up with is that the dire wolves seem to be okay with being warged or like being warged and bonded to the to the Stark children, as opposed to like, say, Varamir's Shadowcat or Snowbear who fight Varamir. Um, but yeah, I, I really think that that for the most part, it, the sorcery without a hilt thing is real. Um, I'm seeing some other good questions in here. So I'm going to grab some of these. Yeah. So ravenous reader points out that all the golden kernels falling out of Bran's pocket and the crows demanding seed from Bran basically means that he's, instead of being able to have children, he's, he's sacrificing that for magical power. And that's actually a running theme um, in the story is uh, magicians who sacrifice their own children in order to gain magical power. Danny actually did it, you know, in a sense, she sacrificed her child and got dragons instead. Um, even though it's debatable, like how much, you know, how aware she was of that trade, the idea of, of the others uh, sacrificing babies to the others. Um, so this is all, I think that's, that's what's going on. Potency swap, exactly. Um, oh, okay. There was a question back here I wanted to grab. Sorry, guys, I'm just scrolling through the chat here. Wiz, what were you asking about the Green Seer Wars? Uh, let's see. Who do you think is stealing... Um, who do you think is stealing swords from the crypts of Winterfell? Well, I mean, it was Bran. I think maybe you misunderstood uh, what Barbary's line there. When she says someone's been stealing swords from the crypts, she's talking about the swords that Hodor and Bran and Mira took when they left the crypts, um, I believe. What do you think about Bran becoming king at the end of the show? Well, that's what I'm trying to answer, Ravenous Reader, with these essays. Um, I think, and again, just to preview the next one, Ravenous, what I noticed is that the first king of Westeros was 
a green man, Garth the Green. He's literally called the first king. And he's essentially a green man who plants weirwoods. And in my opinion, was probably a green cedar. Uh, Stone Dancer, that was the question I was looking for. Thanks, I'll get that next. Um, and then when the story opens, Ravenous Reader, who's the king? It's Robert, another summer king. And so the story opens with summer and a summer king. Summer ends very quickly, the summer king dies. We're going through winter and we're gonna end with a dream of spring and a new summer king on the throne, which is gonna be Bran. So it's basically just coming back around to where we started. And that is the uh, thesis statement, if you will, for the next essay. Um, all right, so the question I wanted to get to, the chat is moving fast, thanks guys. Thanks for coming out and chatting. Stone Dancer, I asked about the Deepwood Mont as Green Seer War symbolism. Yeah, so it's that chap, it's it's the, um, what's the name of it? Uh, the Wayward Bride. Yes, thank you. It's only my favorite chapter in the books. The Wayward Bride. So there's the, the line that Asha, the giveaway line is when Asha says, you know, she recalls the tales of the children of the forest turning the trees into warriors. So that could be <clears throat> a story about the creation of the others. And then all throughout that chapter, we have other kinds of tree personification. Uh, the Northmen dress up like trees. And, you know, Asha says things like, oh, ho, the, you know, the shrubberies on the run or whatever it is. And <clears throat> so you've got a, and then Asha at the end of her fight is backed up against a tree like a sacrifice. And she struck a lightning like blow, which gives you the lightning striking the tree thing. So it turns into a whole Nissa Nissa tree sacrifice scene at the very end. So there's definitely, um, a lot of green seer war inside the weirwood net. I do plan on getting back to the whole battle inside the weirwood net idea. I had a whole compendium plan for that. Uh, I think the one we need to really compare that to would be the, the battle of the whispering woods with Rob. That scene is full of green seer clues and that's another battle inside the trees. Um, so yeah, that's really what we have to do is just compare those and figure out what is going on, what the two sides are, and what the what the goal is there, and who wins. But I have this is either the others getting expelled from the weirwood net or some sort of answering thing that's going on there. So um yeah, I guess and I'd like to take a minute to say uh say a word for everyone in Florida dealing with the oncoming hurricane if you're there, wishing you the best, hoping that you uh, are safe, you and your loved ones have uh, either evacuated or battened down the hatches and hopefully it won't be quite as bad as everyone think. Um, but yeah, I know a couple of you were commenting on a couple days ago, I'll come to the stream if I still have a house. So it's kind of real for some of those folks. So stay safe, everyone. Uh, Okandro says, uh, how do you see the symbolism of the three-eyed crow and blood raven and their agendas? Are they opposite symbols like the sun and the black sun? So I think that the three-eyed crow is essentially the opposite of your Night King figure. And that's why I really think that we will say, um, we will, sorry, not say, we will see an actual Night King, at least inside the weirwood net, some sort of great other, some sort of presence some sort of first, you know, like I said, a, a leftover of the Night King, which really could be, if you think about it, a Zora High. And there's lots of clues about a Zora High being stuck inside the Weirwood Net. And it makes you think of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, about Inaluke, who's an Azora High figure who essentially got trapped in the Netherworld for hundreds of years. And when he came back out, he was essentially like a Night King figure. So I, I think that the Three-Eyed Crow to the extent that Blood Raven and Bran occupy that same role, they're essentially the head of the Night's Watch and the armies of man, and they stand in opposition to the Night's King. And that's why I think you, you see the Lord Commanders of the Night's Watch having the Ravens on their shoulder, even though they're not Green Seers, is because the original Lord Commanders would have been uh, Green Seers. So Mormon's got one, John's got one. Um, so, yeah. So they are kind of opposite. And as far as the white and black colors go, okay, so the weirwood's all white, 
weirwood thrones are white. If you take the weirwood colors and invert them, you get the shade of the evening trees, right? Black trees, blue leaves. And when you go inside the house of the undying, you find analogs to the others. Cold blue shadows gathered around a cold blue heart, very like the cold shadow others gathered around the heart of winter. And they're associated with basically like inverted weirwood trees. So in the heart of winter, we might have a corrupted weirwood tree. Maybe it's a black tree. And so in that sense, you get the white black color opposite thing with Blood Raven's Cave, something like that. Um, I do love the idea that there's a frozen weirwood tree in the heart of winter. Uh, you know, we got the Night King tree in the show, uh, which was just that, a frozen and blackened weirwood tree. And I, we, we get that uh, weirwood armored in ice, the pale shadow of a weir weirwood armored in ice in the Vermeer Sixkins prologue right before uh, Vermeer does the whole Nissa Nissa weirwood goddess uh, weirwood stigmata routine, and then the others appear. So I very much favor the idea of frozen weirwood material in the heart of winter. Uh, so you could get a white black throne thing going on there as well. And then, of course, I've mentioned many times that um, the uh, you know, Aegon the Conqueror, Rhaegar, all these Targaryen kings who dress in black and are defended by the white shadow Kingsguard, they're all Night King parallels. And they sit in a black throne. So I definitely think the idea of Night King on a black tree throne of some kind, either an actual weirwood tree. I don't think it'll be a shade of the evening tree. I don't think the actual shade trees are like really important. I just think they're a symbolism for the idea of a corrupted weirwood, but who knows? Maybe we'll get a shade of the evening mother effing tree in the heart of winter, but I suspect it'll be more like a frozen and corrupted weirwood, which is symbolic of the other's side of the weirwood net. So. Do I think season eight's backlash will be to the final book's benefit or detriment? Um, hard to say, <clears throat> hard to say. I don't think it'll matter too much. Um, it could make the books look good in contrast because people will be like, oh, this is so much better. Or it could be that some people that were excited about the books got turned off by the bad ending. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the show made George a lot more successful uh, and it made a lot more people book readers. So in the long run, the show has greatly contributed to the popularity of the books. So um, I think it's a win on the whole, but I definitely feel like a lot of people that have that bad taste in their mouth, people that have maybe gotten burned out on Game of Thrones, when Winds of Winter comes out, those people are going to get excited again. And if Winds delivers, which of course it will, then I think that will do a lot to wash out the bad taste and everyone will be pretty stoked. And that's kind of what I'm tapping into guys with these videos, the King brand videos. Like I I'm, I'm done being burnt out over the show. I was never that invested in the show anyways. Um, I've always loved the books The shows fun, but the show flopping doesn't like crush my soul or anything. I understand and sympathize for the people who were more invested with the show um, and the emotional letdown that they experienced, you know, since most people, I guess, didn't like the ending, let's say. Um, but I think that, uh, winds is going to be awesome. And there's so much to look forward to with winds of winter based on just comparing the, what's happened in the show ending to the foreshadowing in the books, just like I did with the King brand so far, there's so much more to do with that. Um, so I think from here until winds of winter, at least on this channel, it's going to be nothing but hype and excitement and getting ready for winds and, I've, I just, I don't know. I'm not feeling burnt out at all. I'm just, I guess I'm part of me is kind of done, kind of glad that the show stuff is like over and we can get back to just, I mean, the ship wars were annoying, right? You know, and the whole sense of debate, you know, and just so much. The debate over whether the ending was good and the tone policing, like everybody, I, we're all ready to move on from that. So Winds of Winter, guys. That's where I'm planting my flag uh, on Winds of Winter foreshadowing. Um, I'm also responding to one of the things that people often ask me about. You know, what about foreshadowing, LML? You're always looking at the old tales and and breaking down stuff. What about predictive stuff? So I'm definitely 
um, getting into that as we, since now we have some rough clues about where this is going, it's a lot easier to do predictive stuff. You can look at brand symbolism and figure out that he's going to be what kind of king he's going to be and what kind of stuff he's going to have to do while he's king. So I am stoked. Um, yeah, T Wow Hype Train, exactly right. So I, you know, a lot of the other YouTube channels that are more focused on the show uh, have moved on to other shows, uh, which makes probably sense for them. Um, but of course, like I said, our channel and our mythical astronomy stuff has always been based on the books. So, you know, we're not going anywhere. Um, I did, we did start the dark channel, uh, Ball the Bard and I did do the uh, sick podcast, Creatist Est. I mentioned that earlier and I'll mention it again. Um, watch Dark on Netflix. There's two seasons out. There's one more coming. We started a YouTube channel because we were talking about Dark so friggin' much. We figured we'd, you know, make a YouTube channel. It's called Sick Podcast Creatist Est, and there's the link. Please go subscribe. Don't watch our video unless you've watched the first two seasons because it's spoilers. Um, but yeah. So I think this is uh, probably a good place to wrap it up with lots of feel-good energy and lots of hype. And like I said, I've got two more King Brand videos coming. Um, the next one has got lots of cool Garth stuff. It's got Bran at the Harvest Feast. Uh, that, that Harvest Feast chapter in A Clash of Kings is full of really cool Prince Bran foreshadowing. Um, so if you'd like the last Green Seer King video, you will like the next one and the one after that, I think. Um, I'm pretty excited about them. And then after that, I will be maybe doing a fourth one to talk about Bran and the others. But after that, I'll be going on to uh, Danny and Euron and all of that stuff that we were talking about earlier, uh, which I'm very excited about. So, And uh, yeah, so thanks again to Wiz the Smith for letting us uh, pilfer his Hollow Hills essay for content today. Thank you, Wiz. And thank you to all my patrons who have stuck with me while I was on a break and going through all kinds of fandom drama and all the rest it means a ton. <laughs> Obviously, you guys, your support. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, the nothing but good stuff to come. If you support me, then you will not only be supporting me for the stuff I've done in the past, but all the fun stuff that I've got coming. So, And then you guys know once Winds of Winter comes out, we will have a great time hacking it apart. We're going to talk about, I mean, guys, there might be a meteor at the ends of Winds of Winter. And if there is... That's going to be fun. But even if there isn't, it's uh, still going to be fun. So there'll be tons of new symbolism to take apart. And then we'll be talking about what's going to happen in A Dream of Spring. So this YouTube channel is not going anywhere. I'm um, not going back to weekly live streams, but I will sprinkle in some live streams. I am going to stick with more uh, produced content. I think that's better for the channel. And I'm sort of enjoying uh, making videos like that. So uh, as I go forward, it'll be a mix of, of like I said, the scripted stuff and uh, occasional Sunday streams like this. And um, I will continue to do like one-on-one -on -one conversations like I did with Quinn last month. Um, I thought that was a good format where basically I had the live conversation first. Uh, we did it live on Patreon, but not on YouTube. And then I edited it down to make it a little leaner and meaner and polished and then put it out as a video. Um, so I'll probably keep doing that kind of thing as well. And uh, yes, thank you very much, mods. Very much appreciate it. A little more work than usual. So thanks. Thanks for that. And uh, thanks for joining us. And like I said, I will see you very soon with King Brand 2. I think it's going to be called Summer King Brand. And that's it. Have a great Sunday and enjoy your uh, holiday weekend.